it doesn't Oh, as I was about to say, I haven't had that lovely woman say that recording <laughs> in progress, and there she was. Okay, here we are. Okay. So, welcome everyone. We have um, today um, Abby from Precision Hydration and uh, Laura Siddle, professional triathlete. Um, and we're going to have a conversation today about um, everything to do with sweat, sodium losses, and um, hydration. Um, and we've got some amazing. Um, bits of information and details from Laura's recent races, um, including some really hot races and also humidity in, in Tokyo. So um, hopefully we're gonna have a really good conversation today. Um, so thank you, Laura, for all the information that you've collected because I um, appreciate that. And actually this is what we're gonna talk about today as well, actually collecting the data and then doing something with it. And I think, you know, doesn't that ring true in terms of as triathletes or athletes, we collect all of this data, but it's knowing actually what to do with it afterwards. It's all very well having that data, but then how do you, how do you interpret it and what, and what do you do with it? Um, that's, think, that's, why, that's why I work with two awesome people like you. <laughs> so you tell me what <laughs> the data, I just like give you some numbers and then uh, you give me the, uh, what it means and interpret it for me, which seems to work all right. <laughs> and I think it, it's been, I mean, certainly for, for, you know, from our perspective and actually I've, you know, had quite a few conversations with um, Abby at Precision um, about sort of some of your data as well, just to kind of for us to really, you know, make sure that we get it right for you. And then you going out there, trialing it and actually, you know, coming back to us with more data and us saying, actually, maybe you do need to change things a little bit more. So, you know, that kind of science and evidence and then you going out and trialing it and as actually as an individual athlete needing to maybe sort of tweak a few things um, as well. Um, so we've got some amazing data from um, from your race in um, Ironman Lanzarote, um, which is obviously a very hot race and, and windy race. Um, and then you went um, out to Tokyo and spent some time in Tokyo. And obviously the humidity levels and heat out there were quite different, um, I would imagine, to, um, to being in Lanzarote. And then raced it um, challenge um, race. And that was obviously a really hot day um, as well. And you had an absolutely amazing result there as well. Um, so really good to see the figures and numbers. Um, and as well as that, um, we've also got your numbers on the amount of carbohydrates that you consumed as well. Um, so, and I think that's really, really interesting as a, a female endurance athlete, actually how much you, um, you're able to tolerate as well. And I think that just shows with, you know, practicing in terms of, um, going out there and testing your, your, um, your fueling strategies that, that we can train, train our gut as well. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think it's been a really interesting, like the last few months sort of since and, and starting to work with precision hydration. Like I did that training camp in Lanzarote, which I guess sort of started it all off. I mean, I think I, we got, I think we collected maybe some data from here in Spain, in Girona, <laughs> sorry, but then it was mainly sort of that initial camp in Lanzarote, trying to get some data um, from running and riding and then being able to use that when I went back for the race um, and sort of then combining that with sort of I guess what I typically done in a race over the past few years in terms of my fueling and nutrition and hydration um and then sort of yeah building on top the time in time in Tokyo it's been really good to then kind of just and, and I feel we're just starting as well I think there's kind of like we can still just keep tweaking and tweaking mm. and every and like you said every race is different and all the conditions are different so um you know if we look ahead to next year in theory um Kona is in Utah St George in May so it's not going to be hot and humid it's going to be pretty cool or cooler so that will probably have a totally different strategy as well I think that was really good um um Abby I know when you when you looked at some of those comparisons as well and actually compared to the data that we got from Lanzarote to um right it was quite different wasn't it in terms of the amount you you drank and took on board and it was almost like kind of you know naturally listening to your body as well um in terms of sort of thirst and and, and what you needed um and I wonder if we might sort of talk about um the sort of testing side of things because um Abby we we often um you know looking at hydration will ask athletes to go out there and actually test their um sweat losses um which is different from obviously testing their sodium sweat losses um, and I guess I just wanted to kind of, you know, have some clarity here in terms of we need to collect actually how much sweat we're actually losing 
in different environments. So whether, I don't need to give an example, an indoor turbo session, um, or actually, the, Laura, when you were out in Lanzarote collecting that data was so specific to your race um, in terms of, you know, the, the heat. Um, but then also looking at a sweat sodium loss um, as well. Um, Absolutely. I think that touching upon the differences there are really important. When we talk about sweat losses and fluid replacement, you have to break that sweat down into these two factors. Like you say, Claire, one is sweat rate, you know, the volume that an athlete loses, how much they sweat, and the other is sweat sodium concentration. What is in that sweat? How salty is that sweat? Is it high or is it low? Is it somewhere in the middle? We see a big continuum between athletes, and that's very individual. It's largely genetically determined. It is what it is. Once you know, you kind of know. Sweat rate, and the, you know, this was a lot of the testing that we started with Laura, is far more variable. Again, as you've said, between different conditions. And that kind of testing can you know, keep rolling on. You should almost never stop doing that. It's something to keep an eye on um, because as conditions change, sweat rate will change, as intensity changes, even as your heat acclimation as an athlete changes, your sweat rate will change with that. So I'd encourage most athletes to undergo some form of sweat rate testing. And that's really easy to do. It's just pre and post weighing um, and weighing, you know, any fluids consumed in that time as well, factoring in that duration um, and looking at, you know, that volume of sweat that they lose and trying to, like Laura did prior to Lanzarote, do it in conditions that replicate race day so that we're actually looking at comparable data. When when you talk about that testing and so for athletes generally, because we would do it, we did it various ways. So we would do it over like over a run, and that run might be 40 minutes, it might have been an hour sort of thing. But then we also looked at it over longer bike rides. Now it's a lot harder over a bike ride to get numbers because you're just a longer duration, you're eating more probably solid food or bars and, and that sort of thing. So is there a kind of optimum or I mean I know it's great obviously to get a range of data because then the, a more is better in some ways but is there kind of an optimum length of a training session that you think is kind of ideal before you go into different systems yeah it's a great question and it is there is almost no perfect way of doing it um, I would say somewhere in the region of two hours for a couple of reasons one is that if you do a single hour you've obviously got a bit of a lag in sweat you know, you beginning to sweat. For some people, it can be 15, 20 minutes before they start sweating. And so in that calculation, that's 15 minutes where a person isn't actually sweating yet. So that's why that two hours is nice because you've got plenty of time for an athlete to be sweating at the rate that we'd expect to see, you know, if we mimic those conditions in a race. I think anything longer than two, three hours, again, as you said, Laura, starts to get a bit cloudy, the data, because a person is probably reaching towards more real foods. Um, you've got some glycogen depletion, so that's weight loss that isn't necessarily sweat loss. Um, however, that's not to say that data collected from them longer rides becomes useless. You might just need to do, you know, do a few more repeats. Um, and that's why I think you just, this is something that athletes can just be doing ongoing um, in the background. It, it doesn't take any you know, large additional effort to jump on the scales before and jump after um, and you know, record what you've eaten and drunk. Um, and over time, we just keep learning. You know, Claire opened this conversation with lots of learning goes on. And you know, we'll, the three of us will keep tweaking things you know, next year, even though so much has been learned this year. And we saw great improvement in you, Laura, from Lanza to Challenge Roth. And we can talk about that a bit later you know, we'll keep refining and keep tweaking as we continue to learn. I think it was really interesting, actually, wasn't it, Laura, with um, when you first started collecting the data, there was um, a couple of sessions where you did some really long bikes in um, in Spain. And, um, you know, we noticed then that um, probably some of that, as Abby just touched on, was probably, you know, using up some glycogen stores, so we couldn't be 100% sure. But actually, what was really interesting is as you did some other tests that were kind of around about the two hour mark actually your sweat losses are relatively high I think some of them are in the region of above 1.5 um liters per hour so they were kind of starting to get into the um higher categories um because I think Abby you know average athlete is around about depending on weight obviously it's around about a liter to a liter and a half isn't it in terms of average average sort of yeah. losses 
we'd say that's like a moderate sweat rate yeah. um, and you'd see sort of a well-conditioned athlete to be yeah. losing in excess of a litre per hour and not that wouldn't be too much of a surprise greater than a litre and a half as you said Claire is verging on sort of a high sweat rate and the reason that you might just take a little bit more note to that number is for a number of reasons one when you bring it back to those two factors again a sweat rate of 1.5 litres per hour acts as a multiplying factor on that sweat sodium concentration so sweat sodium concentration when we get that number it's milligrams of sodium lost per litre of sweat Mm -hmm. sweat rate is liters lost per hour so you know this number that we start with for laura i'm sure she won't mind saying is around 600 mm -hmm. milligrams of sodium per liter if we then were then to look at her hourly loss we need to multiply that 600 by a factor of 1.5 mm -hmm. because she's not losing just a liter per hour she's losing a liter and a half yeah suddenly laura's net sodium loss per hour you know is far closer yeah. to that thousand mark Yep. which was in line with the kind of strength that Laura might use during some of those training sessions, you know, the pH 1000. Um, I think so. it's quite interesting because we started off, didn't we, Laura, with, because um, just for various reasons, getting you, um, you know, you're, <laughs> you're dotted all around, all around the, uh, the world. And um, we eventually managed to do your, um, your um, sweat sodium loss as well, which, as I've said, was around about 700. But before that, we had, we had another figure that we thought it, might be around which we weren't too far off um and actually um we tested out which i thought was quite interesting um we tested out um a slightly higher strength of sodium and i guess this this is where i find it really interesting and and where i truly believe that actually you know working with athletes on an individual level is just so important because we were working with that higher strength of um 1500 which we should point out is milligrams of sodium um <laughs> is um you know was making you feel quite thirsty wasn't it so I, don't, I wonder if you just want to talk a little bit about you know you were really sort of following what we suggested doing and you're saying hang on a minute I'm actually now drinking huge amounts or feeling thirsty the whole time yeah it's funny because I think like what I do in a race is pretty structured and rigid and I've kind of like with flexibility but then I've done that for years and years but then and it's funny because you're always meant to say you know practice in training what you do in a race and I never really do um, partly because I take a lot of gels in a race and I just don't want to be taking them all the time in training, but on a hydration front as well, I'm probably not the best on a day-to-day -day basis. So for a lot of my training, um, I'd just be fueling with water or maybe a really weak electrolyte mix. Cause, um, I don't like anything kind of too, too strong and stuff, but then what I was finding when we were putting the pH 15 and it was actually sort of felt really kind of quite salty and then would make me almost feel more thirsty and want to drink more and, and just be trying to like grab um, sparkling water and stuff like that. But I don't know that it was just because it was, there was varying, like one, yes, it was, you know, finding out then what my sweat sodium rate was, but also probably because I'm just, my body had probably been starved and just so used to being on water all the time in training and adapted to some level, not that that's a good thing that then suddenly it was sort of getting overloaded. But now, but the one thing that surprised me, I know um, when we then went into Lanzarote and kind of the recommendation was race morning to have a pH 1500 in a 500 milliliter bottle of water, I think it was. And I was kind of thinking, heck, that's going to be really kind of concentrated and really sort of salty to take, to to take but again the advice was drink to thirst so it wasn't and I drank it and didn't even notice it kind of thing on race morning so it didn't like it just was super easy to take and obviously I needed it and and that was the right prep then going into the race for the rest of the day yeah they, I think there's a few things to touch on there the first one with that feeling thirst is a great example of why we refine it for each individual because we'll often get asked you know, we have three different strength electrolyte drinks and people are always asking, you know, which one should I be taking? And they might even ask, why can't I just take the 1500 all the time? You know, then I've just got all bases covered. I'm definitely taking enough. And we always counter that with, you know, we're always looking for the zero sum equation, first of all, where we're only putting in what an athlete is losing. And the big reason why we try to optimize it is for what you kind of experienced, Laura. You know, nothing majorly bad is going to happen 
happen if an athlete chooses to use a 1500 all the time. But you might be acutely overdoing the sodium, which then forces the body to try and you know, balance the scale. So you put a bit too much sodium in versus fluid. The body wants to rebalance that imbalance by making you thirsty, perhaps giving you a dry mouth. You know, you feel a craving for plain water because it's just the body trying to bring things back in line, dilute that sodium you've put in the body and increase its fluid levels. So it's, you know, it's not a horrific thing. It's unlikely to hugely be detrimental to performance, but it's uncomfortable. And what you guys are doing is already uncomfortable enough. So let's get it right and optimize it. And that's what, you know, the three of us worked out eventually and having that sweat test was really useful and we zoned in on, on your right level in the end. I think, and I think the interesting part there as well to, to pull in is when you, Laura, when you felt really thirsty after using the pH, um, the 1500 is when we actually swapped it to slightly lower, that felt more comfortable, but, and it felt more comfortable for the training that you were doing. And then when you went into the hotter environment in Lanzarote, actually 1500 felt comfortable. So yeah. I think it's that, you know, making sure from an environmental point of view that you're adapting and that's exactly what you did and, and almost without overthinking it like you said you thought it's gonna be really salty and you're like actually didn't think any anything more of it so you know that's why it's really important as well as athletes that we do listen to our body um and can adapt and sort of change you know what what we're doing um and i think um you know what what was also interesting is the is the amount that you're able to drink over a race so when we looked at your information from um the amount of fluid you're able to drink over a race we looked at your data from um lanzarote and then also into um, the racing roads as well. And um, I'm absolutely amazed by how much you managed to take on during a run. I mean, I, you know, as a professional triathlete, you, you know, and actually I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring back the point that you said about, you know, you all, we always tell athletes to train with their nutrition and we absolutely do. But actually for you as an athlete, you are racing so much, essentially you are training your gut the whole time. So, you know, you're, you've, you're racing enough to be able to train your gut to take that amount of carbohydrate on board. Um, and I hope you don't mind us sharing, but actually, you know, you can tolerate up to 120 grams of carbohydrate per hour. Um, and actually some of the um, some of the data that we got back, I know we had averages where on the run it drops off a bit more to compared to, which is typical actually of what we see. And um, Abby, it's probably typical of what you've seen more recently in some data collection in terms of, you know, the run that we tend to take a little bit less in terms of carbohydrates and the bike we kind of really optimize but still up on some of those results i think we had one of your races around 70 with 78 grams of carbs per hour you know on average across the bike and the on and on the run um which is still amazing when you average it out over over a course of a race um how tell us a little bit about um just thinking of the practicalities of it you know maybe walk us through a little bit about you know how you're getting enough hydration um, you know, going through the feed stations, for example, people that don't race very often, you know, going through a feed station, collecting a bottle, you know, people often dropping bottles, you know, give us some tips about what you do. And also from a run perspective, I find that really interesting how you run through a feed station and manage to still be able to drink, you know, drink enough, I guess. Yeah. So, I mean, when I do a race, I feel it's still look that I look a little bit like a pack horse the, rather than like a, a professional athlete. But I, so I have an aero bottle on the front of my bike in between my aero bars. And then I have one bottle on the frame, but I actually have two bottle cages on the frame. Now the aerodynamic nuts out there will probably go, yeah, that's slowing you down. It's not very aerodynamic, but what I do, particularly in the hotter races is that that spare space is for me to grab water bottles. And if I haven't got time, as I go through an aid station to empty it into my aero bottle, or if it's particularly hot in a Lanzarote and I kind of, there was one point where it was quite a long way between aid stations. This distance was the same, but it was on a long, it was on an uphill drag into the, into the headwind. And so it took us longer to get between the aid stations. By the time I got there, I was completely out. So actually I needed to grab almost like I needed to go through an aid station, grab two bottles. And so I was able to put one straight in the spare, the spare bottle cage. And actually at that point, I think I'd got rid of my other bottle as well. Cause that had gone. So I actually was two in the bottle cages. So Going back, how do we start? So in the aero bottle on the front, depending on the 
temperature that the race is going to be. Uh, I think we've had, uh, we've used pH 500 in there and that's a 750 or 700 mil bottle of water. So that's kind of where I start my drinking from. And then in the frame, we've used a concentrated like a 1500, I think in on the frame. And then I use that to top up the aero bottle with pH along the way. And then at an aid station, I'm just grabbing water. Um, I will try and, depending on the dynamics of a race, but I would say, and this is where it probably differs for age groupers to professionals. I will on the whole try and grab water at every aid station, particularly in hot conditions, because you just never know if you're going to get the next one. Um, and either that just tops up the front aero bottle or I'll get I'll pour it over my head if it's hot. So it's as, use it as a cooling or depending if I feel like I need it for longer, I'll put it in that spare cage. Um, there were times in Roth and it was interesting because I didn't think I drank a lot in Roth on the bike. I was certainly not compared to Lanzarote, but um, there were times on the bike that I didn't take anything through an aid station because either I didn't want to lose the group or I was trying to get away from people. So that was a bit different. Um, trying to think then on, so that's kind of for, for the bike. Oh, and then I guess the other things that I do, again, because it's all storage and where you can carry things. So um, what we did so Lanzarote is a bit of a different race as well because it does have a special needs um, aid station, but you had to pull in off the course and especially with COVID times and get your bag yourself and things like that. So I had put, again, another bottle of, I think, PH 1500 in my special needs in case I was kind of like totally, I'd lost things and very much needed to stop to get it. But as it turned out, I didn't want to lose the time going in. And again, this is where I think it, it differs. I didn't want to lose the time going in and I did have backup and what we did for backup on there, I used the salt tablets. So I'd cut down, I'd cut, I don't know, I think three or four strips of the three salt tablets. And I think it was kind of three tablets per 50, uh, 500 of water or something like that. And so when I ran out of sort of the the pH mix, I could then you, and I was just then relying on water on course, I was using the salt tablets to try and replenish stocks as well. Um, so that's kind of what, what we did there. And then, yeah, for the run, it's, I mean, it's always, I think in, again, in Lanzarote with it being particularly hot, I ran out of transition with a bottle of water as well. Um, so I had that in transition. Um, but then I tend to have like a routine as I go through an aid station and it involves either depend again, depending on the weather and the heat, but although it tends to be the same, regardless of the, even if it's cold, I still seem to grab the same stuff. It's sort of habit, but you're grabbing water and trying to drink that to start with. Then I probably try and grab a Coke and then I'll try and grab water again at the end of the aid station before I move on. Um, and then if it's hot, I'm grabbing ice as well and chucking that down my back or my front. And, again just try and go like don't miss an aid station because you just don't know it's not worth it at that point either mm -hmm. I think you know you must get just so proficient at doing it as well because I think people like you say it depends on where you are um with your racing I guess whether you're at the back of the pack or you're, you're at the front of the pack and um you know thinking about some age groupers that may be a bit slower I think there is more opportunity to slow down and drink too much um, and that's some of the education that um, certainly we give um, to athletes and Abby, I'm sure you do as well in terms of, you know, this kind of over drinking, um, because people often think they just drink and drink and drink. But actually, you know, over drinking can be just as dangerous as under drinking um, and that kind of over hydration. And that's really where the, you know, the, the sodium element becomes the important factor there um, as well. Um, but it's amazing to hear like how you breeze through an aid station and you manage to get all of these things as you as you go, which is amazing. And I think the data, um, I was just having a, a recap of your data before we um, did this session today. And I think, Abby, I don't know if you've got it there in front of you, but I think over, um, I think per hour on your rate race, I think you managed to drink a fair amount of fluid. Um, and I know it's an estimation because it is going through and taking it, but that with your coat, your water and your coat. I mean, yeah. I mean, as anyone will know, as they run through an aid station, they give us the water in those cups. And 
yeah. it's always a bit potluck how much is actually in there and then how much actually goes in there into your yeah. mouth and not yeah, just yeah. Where <laughs> exactly or or you've run and knocked it out as you've run yeah. but yeah it's um yeah you do and that's why you kind of just go for I, I try and get as make sure I'm getting water at the beginning and the end and then the, the coke in the middle and I think that's how you can see also how people do overhydrate when they're going slower you know so if, if you are uh, being more steady on your run actually I think that's where we see this this kind of um hyponatremia or sort of low sodium levels don't we and I, I think some of the um certainly some of the um the studies that have been done is in the slower marathon runners or the slower kind of endurance athletes and you can see how that can happen really hot day and if you walked through you would drink more wouldn't you because you're walking and you're um, able to sort of take on board and as you say if you're running through how much goes on you and how much actually goes in your mouth are two are two sort of very, very the, the important thing too is not mix not mix up the water and the coke so the water goes in the mouth or over the head the coke only goes in the mouth like the coke over the head or red bull over the head is not a fun thing to do yeah that's that's sticky and horrible isn't it yeah. i mean you tend to be at that stage you're fairly sticky and horrible anyway but it's still not pleasant <laughs> and um, um it's really interesting having sort of um you know you before sort of us all working together you know as a professional athlete with many sort of years in the sport you um, have very much sort of one trained your gut which is amazing you know I've kind of touched on the fact of how much you can tolerate is is, is fantastic um, and you'd very much kind of you know had your idea of sort of how you plan out sort of where your gels go and you know as you said predominantly you use gels and on the bike and and on your run um, and you use a little bit of coke as well do you tend to use your coke the coke as kind of carbohydrate or a little bit of carbohydrate or is it in addition because it's always interesting isn't it with coke because I understand from an athlete perspective, actually there are times where you just take it and it's like a bit of a, not really using it for, for carbohydrate, but it is. Um, Do you know, it, the Coke tends to be, I think I've taken on a bottle of Coke on the bike once and that was in Kona a couple of years ago and I was just having a horrible day and it was just like anything save me please um but normally and we can talk about caffeine as well because we know i tend to do, take quite a lot of caffeine early on in terms of the gels and and stuff but um i take the coke on the run i think it because i know i'm not getting as i'm not taking the gels as whether it's as frequently or getting as much out of the gels, because at that stage, it's not that my gut and I'm touching wood because I think I've been very lucky with racing. Um, it's not that my gut has an issue with the gels. You just kind of lose the taste of, or you just want something else. And whilst Coke still is that kind of like sweet, sticky taste, it's just something different. And so I think I tend to go for the Coke a little bit the caffeine but more just like a little bit of sugar and a bit of a hit just to keep me ticking over that way because I know I'm probably not getting as much gel mm. in as I was doing on the bike mm. I think it's interesting isn't it because we always talk about sort of taste taste fatigue taste and texture fatigue and for some athletes actually having a variety of different textures as well so on the bike you know maybe having some chews or on the run they prefer that and even holding it in their mouth whilst they're running you know, so it's really interesting just to hear sort of different people's um, or athletes, different ways that they fuel. And I think that's also what we see. I think the difference between athletes that are faster at the front of the pack and professional athletes compared to kind of our, um, our athletes that are a little bit slower. You know, they've got more time to sort of eat as well um, and a less, you know, lower intensity as well. So, yeah. um, you know, and, and that's always really interesting to sort of speak to athletes about how to get sort of different different sort of tastes and and textures in as well so I can understand that coke perspective is just something different isn't it um so that is uh, um, really interesting and um you you talked about sort of caffeine and um I mean habitually you drink quite a lot of caffeine as well and I think you know that's not that's not a bad thing uh, you know at all and we we talk about when and how to use caffeine but I think Abby had done a really nice calculation actually on the amount of caffeine that you that you have in your gels but it it works for you and it's something that you that you find um, is something you've done sort of over the years. Um, and you actually decant your gels, don't you, into, into bottles as well? Yeah, so I mean, that's a little bit of a storage thing on the bike as well. So I got little flasks and they tend to fit about four gels into a flask. And so I then know that if I'm taking a gel every kind of 20 minutes and I write on, 
And it's almost a little bit of a pre-race procedure in terms of mindset of getting into that race mode is I try and do it two or three days before the race. So it's not a big panic. And that's when I know I'm kind of, if I, if I get it done two or three days before like bike racking and race day, then I know I'm in a pretty calm place. If it's the day before then I know I've had like a panicked rushed week. Um, but that whole process of actually putting, so lying, laying all the nutrition out. Um, and I lay, lay it out in sort of four gels together. So that's one going in one flask and, and, along and then when I bring caffeine in and then yeah decant them into a flask and you know write the number on and then I tend to then write motivational quotes or whatever you want to do it on the flask as well I very rarely read them and I know that's just going it's like but it's like kind of that process but yeah from a storage point of view I then have so on the bike I'm on the whole on the whole I've got four flasks with four gels each in um Number three and number four flasks are in the bento box on my bike already, or when I put them in race morning. And then the first two flasks that I'm going to access as soon as I get onto the bike, they go in my transition bag and I put them into back pockets on the run. So they're already there at a handy, handy place for, for when I start the bike. Um, I mean, the interesting thing in Lanzarote was, um, and it's the first time it's ever happened, I actually lost one of those early gel flasks at about two or three K into the bike. And I probably could have gone back and I don't think I'd have lost that much, but you know, you're kind of in that race mode and I was just like, no, let's just get going. It'll be fine. And also knowing that I almost over, 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 not overfeed, that's the wrong word, but have surplus, I guess. And I've also got like spare gels again like in case special needs or in case that happens so I kind of knew I'd probably got enough to get me through but it did mean I would be going on to in Lanzarote I was bringing the caffeine in even earlier because I kind of lost four normal gels out of the equation um and it also it also made me a bit more um conscious of going through aid stations and perhaps just looking at what nutrition they had in case I needed to grab something later on um yeah I think that's really good about you know you talk about and this is something we always talk to athletes about is you know making sure that you've kind of got an a b and even a c plan if you do drop something or um you know so having something a little extra with you um you know we talked about coke there and you know fluids and things like that like being able to have a plan but it for it to be flexible so for it not to be sort of set in in stone and certainly with hydration that's one of the things that we you know we always talk about is this kind of flexible this flexible plan um so um I I just wanted to touch a little bit because I found it really interesting having worked with a number of athletes in Tokyo um at the Olympics this year and you were lucky enough to to go um along to support the um the para triathletes um which is an amazing story in its in itself and um It was really interesting um, kind of listening to the athletes that I had in Tokyo and kind of the um, the things that they had put in place in terms of slushies and cooling procedures. And obviously because it was it was hot and it was humid. Um, And when you were out there, um, you were working um, along, obviously, the um, the British team um, and they were actually doing some testing that you had already done before. So it was quite familiar to you in terms of sort of weighing yourself and um, fluid losses. um, and also taking urine um, osmol- osmolarity readings as well. So I know that was something that was quite new to you. Um, so I just wanted I just wanted to really kind of because um, um, whilst you were there, we sort of tweaked a little bit, didn't we? Your um, your sodium as well to try and to try and sort of get those urine um, figures down a little bit, which which seemed to work. But tell us a little bit about how it was like in that humidity training and and kind of you know fluid and eating and. Yeah, it was funny because, I mean, yeah, so I was going out as a reserve guide for the two visually impaired athletes, that two females that we had in British paratriathlon. So they had their race guides and I was just there as a reserve in case anything had happened and the race guides couldn't couldn't compete. But um, considering that they, you know, British triathlon and British paratriathlon are amazing and the preparation and the research that they do they did with the teams and the athletes leading into Tokyo was fantastic 
but as a reserve I hadn't done any of that so hadn't done any heat acclimatization hadn't done like so was kind of going into it not really knowing what to expect and almost not having had that process or that education on it being hotter and more humid and 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 just no baseline of numbers um actually it was interesting going back Abby you said something earlier about um when you're doing the testing and if you do it over an hour sometimes that's a bit short because you don't necessarily sweat for the first 20 minutes and in fact I noticed it on one I would come back from a run and it would just be an easy run when I was out there for the first few weeks and your heart rate might be a little bit elevated but it wasn't actually as bad as we were expecting but I would be dripping absolutely dripping like you'd stand back in the hotel foyer and again we had different covid meant we could only enter and exit on different certain floors but I would stand there and if I'd literally stood there for about 10 seconds, I'd look down and it was just like a puddle of sweat already where I'd just stopped and everything had been dripping. But the interesting fact was that I would do a run and like, uh, this was like a few days in as we got towards sort of, I guess a week there, I'd be running and I'd get to 40 minutes and I'm like, oh, I'm not sweating as much anymore. And it was like at 40 minutes, someone turned a tap on. And after 40 minutes, I would suddenly look down and I'd just be drenched again. But yet for the first bit, I was like, oh, it seemed, I seem to be, seem to be okay. And then it would just be like, oh no, I'm now drenched again. Um, but yeah, so from a testing point of view, we, um, they were testing us all. So first thing in the morning when we got up, we had to pee in a pot um, and we weighed ourselves as well. So they were using our, how stable, our weight was, I guess, just making sure we weren't having any dramatic weight losses and using that, and Abby, you'd be able to say more, but using that in conjunction with the urine and the osmolarity of that, um, and then using that to, just to make sure you were hydrating enough in the hot and humid conditions. And so, yeah, morning routine would be get up, pee in the pots, go and drop that off at, um, at the, yeah, team room, bathroom, weigh yourself, take your temperature because that was a COVID protocol and then go and have your COVID test in the morning. So that was our regular, and also kind of they had a little wellness card where you filled in like how you're feeling, muscle fatigued, how you slept and all that sort of stuff. So yeah, and then you'd get that, once that had been tested, you'd get the numbers back every day and then it'd be like, oh, it's a bit high today or, you know, make sure you're drinking more. Or if, and the interesting thing for me was like, I'd never done any of that side of the testing before so you know I really had no knowledge of what was it was meant to be what was good what was bad so I was sort of getting these daily reports back saying oh it's a bit high and I was like well yeah no, you know what does that mean that do doesn't mean anything to me it's just that's just a snapshot what are we what does that so it was only after I guess a few days um and then yeah and speaking back with with you Claire and the work we'd done and the and Abby and the work we'd done where at least we'd done the pre and post running weigh-ins and could work out sweat loss that way. Um, and so just, and again, I think I'll go back to what I was saying when I was in originally training. I think I was in Tokyo and I knew I had to hydrate more because it was hot and humid. But again, I kind of went back to that default of just uh, using water um, and didn't really think that it was, and yes, I would use, the electrolytes and the pH when I was training but then just during the day I'd just be like well I just I'll just make sure I'm drinking water and hadn't really clicked that actually no you still need to be it's the electrolyte loss you still need to be, be replenishing during the day as well and so once we kind of tweaked that and upped I think we started I think started using a few pH 1500s and, and thousands kind of thing and it the yeah we sort of brought it back down into what seemed to be a bit more normal for me and I can totally see and Abby you might want to comment on this as well like you know when you change environment and that kind of as you say Laura that kind of go to you first that kind of like I just need to drink water and then almost forgetting because like you have so many things on you know in a different environment and being in that um uh you know performance um team aspect you know and as as professional triathletes you're not really in that team aspect like you are when you go out um, to a team Olympic Games so I, I can understand how that felt really different and a very very different environment um, and it was easy to see like you know when you actually fed back to me you know what you were doing we're like actually hang on a minute we need to be 
probably rehydrating a little bit better after um, you know the end of your day and, and we actually swapped to that higher strength um, uh, the 1500 milligrams of, of sodium and that seemed to sort of bring bring the figures um, down a bit. Abby I don't know whether you want to touch on those those figures at all or any comments on testing like urine urine osmolarity at all? Yeah I think it's worth definitely pointing out that you guys did the right thing and it is that change of environment that might spark that need for an electrolyte drink you know, throughout the day. That isn't something that most athletes would warrant under kind of, you know, certainly in the UK um, or even in just their usual climate if they're, you know, well accustomed to it. But when you move out to somewhere far hotter, far more humid, you've got to account for that more passive sweating that just goes on throughout the day. You know, the tap is just on your fluid and sodium losses a little bit more and you want to factor in for those by perhaps sipping on an electrolyte drink more frequently just throughout the day not necessarily just in and around that training so yeah it was you know pleasing when I heard post all of that 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 was the action that was taken because I think it was the right action um it's also really good to hear what the team were doing I think that's that whole practice of doing the urine and the body weight first thing in the morning and actually what you said there Laura about that wellness card is the first I've heard of that as well and that's also kind of the third thing that I would have expected them to be looking at you know it's, it's very hard to measure someone's hydration status without being quite invasive the easiest way to do that is to look at their urine you know and if you get no one's got an osmometer then just look at whether it's dark or light um, look at their weight you know has there been more than a two percent change in body weight you know if that body weight is down from your kind of baseline and that's suggestive right that you're dehydrated and the third one is are you thirsty you know do you feel like you need to drink because again as we've said earlier in this conversation that's the body encouraging you to put some more fluids back in the body so um, I think it's really really positive what they were doing and it was you know, maybe perhaps because they hadn't got that background data on you, Laura, it wasn't so helpful originally when they were just telling you that it was high with perhaps not what to do with that number, which is quite classic with all data that's collected in sports science. You know, people are quite comfortable with collecting the data, but it's that, right, What? how do we use it? That is always the challenge. Um, it did, you know, together and reaching out to Claire, you kind of came to the right solution. You saw that number come down. Um, I imagine weight would have been, you know, stabilised and you probably felt a bit better as well and weren't feeling like you need yeah. to reach for that plain water all the time. I think as well, as well, like off the, off the back of travel and like the, if you're taking like a long haul flight as well, and it might not necessarily, necessarily be that you're going to hot, humid conditions, but just, I think being conscious off the back of a long flight, what your hydration state is absolutely flying is is hugely dehydrating because of the low humidity in an aircraft it's you know down by like 30 percent whereas normal comfortable humidity for the average human is 60 to 70 and that low humidity is incredibly drying and so if you've done a long haul flight and you're in that condition for quite a period of time and also just the mechanics of going through the airport not being able to take your own fluids having to buy it in customs it's really expensive like it's just the whole process is not ideal for staying well hydrated. So being mindful of that in the air, eating lots of fruits and vegetables, and then when you land, making sure you're getting on top of that hydration quickly, probably by mixing up an electrolyte tablet, just because adding those electrolytes, and this isn't something that we've perhaps not explained, um, but it's just really fundamental. Why do electrolytes help you know, with hydration level? When you put a bit more sodium in, to fluid it just helps the body retain that fluid a bit better the, you know if you drink an excess of just plain water often that can cause an upregulation of urinary excretion in the kidneys but putting a bit of salt a bit of sodium in that drink helps the body actually retain that fluid a bit better so it's better at hydrating you i think um i think what what's sort of really come out and sort of in in summary really to our conversation is you know having a um a really experienced professional triathlete like yourself, Laura, you know, you have raced for many, many years and like, you know, perform extremely well at a really high level. And you've, you know, you've tested out your nutrition and your hydration for many years. So, you know, coming to us and 
actually having this little extra bit of advice and tweaking things, I think has also been a really interesting journey because, you know, we're, we're talking about the kind of, you know, 5% or 2% of these little tweaks that actually make the difference. So, um, and that's been really interesting for, for certainly for myself working with you, and I'm sure with Abby working with you, you know, actually it's, it's not sort of starting from nowhere. It's actually saying, you know, this is what I usually do, which is already fantastic, actually, but how can I, how can I make this, how can I make this better and how can I optimize it further? And I think one of the, you know, one of the other things to sort of draw in from the summary is that just because you have experience doesn't mean to say that the testing doesn't continue. You know, what we've talked about today is that actually it's been continual testing um, and collecting that data um, and then doing something with that data as well to, to make, you know, to optimize that performance or that recovery, um, you know, even further. Um, and I think actually when you have that data and you see um, the benefits of that, um, you know, has been really useful. And with um, Abby's help from um, Precision, obviously, you know, actually looking at all those figures and all those numbers and the work that we've all done together has been certainly, you know, really interesting to see how, you know, little changes really sort of make, make quite a big, make quite a big difference as well. Um, so thank you so much both for, for um, joining us today. It's been, um, hopefully it's been really sort of valuable to, to everybody as well, but it's certainly been really, a really great chat. And Laura, thank you so much for sharing all your insiders information. Um, <laughs> people love just to know what athletes do. And, um, you know, it's amazing to see how well you do with your nutrition and, and your hydration and how you get through an aid station and all your little your little tips there, and um, Abby for sharing all the advice and um, and all the um, the science background behind precision, which um, you know is just is just so important that there's evidence and science that sits behind the advice that you guys give and um, the reason why we collect data and why we test um, as well. So thank you both for joining. Yeah, us. Yeah, and and I just I think you know like you said like yes I've been doing it for a long time although I still feel very new into the sport but I think this year and working with like precision hydration with you, I mean, actually like getting after the race and like you guys coming back and say, right, what did you, what did you take? What did you, in terms of that fluid and hydration and, and um, the calories of the gels and stuff, and then sort of getting that, getting that report back and getting your comments back on going actually, like, I think, you know, there was a, I think maybe it was for Roth and I was like I don't think I drank when I was actually filling it in of what I'd taken on during the race and yes there's all a, it's a bit approximate but I was like oh I don't think I actually drank enough in the race and yes it was different conditions but then when you kind of went through it and went through numbers it was actually well it was actually kind of almost on a par with Lanzarote given the different conditions and the length of the bike and stuff like that and it was that sort of oh okay so I did or yes it was a conscious thought afterwards that yeah I just need to be aware of that next time that I just need to keep on top of it to make sure I am I don't drop down sort of thing yeah it's it's a good it's a good practice of self-reflection isn't it I yeah. think it's so important that athletes do it while it's fresh um even when an athlete has it dialed in the race has gone perfectly best race of their life I think it's so important to sit down and record what they've done and still look at the numbers you know it all went right why did it go right yeah even more important is when it goes wrong obviously yeah, yeah. why did it go wrong but I think it's easy when things do go right to kind of rest on your laurels and I've actually seen that a few times this season with other athletes they've got it right a couple of times and then they get a bit you know blase about their nutrition and fueling um, and hydration and then it goes wrong and then they come back and say oh you know Abby actually I need to pay a bit more attention to this and it's it is it's the fourth you know discipline that we we need to not ever forget um it, it it's easy to feel like you've nailed it and then leave it but as you said a few times Laura, the conditions are ever changing you always need to be thinking about getting it dialed in zoning it in correctly for that race um i don't think it's something that people can ever you know yeah. consider as a given and i think you know that just, that just shows it's it's a continual learning curve isn't it you know even with all your experience Laura it's it's continually sort of tweaking and trialing things out and um you know as, as you say Abby going, going back and looking at actually you know all of that information after racing or indeed you know after training sessions that where you have yeah. to cover properly you know looking at all that data is is really important and you know nutrition and hydration are such an important part 
um, of the jigsaw that I always talk about, you know, it's really, really important um, that we don't forget about all of those different, those different aspects. And, and for me as well, like there's enough stress going into a race. And so like, if I feel like if I'm pretty dialed in, in terms of at least the routine of my nutrition and hydration on rate on for, for race day, it's like one less, Mm-hmm. yeah things can always happen but that's racing but it's like one less unknown because it's like I know what I'm doing every 20 minutes or every 10 minutes but it also helps you I think the better you are in having that routine and that plan and, and dialing it in with with you guys is that like when things do go wrong or when things do change you can then mm-hmm. be flexible and adapt whereas if you don't have it in place to start with it's kind of then a lot harder to manage when things do go awry. Absolutely. For me anyway, that's my, yeah. <laughs> no, I think that's a really great summary, actually. So um, yeah, thank you so much, both of you, for sharing sharing all that information. And um, and hopefully um, hopefully we can get on and share a little bit more. So maybe maybe going into the, the new Kona um, Utah um, and seeing what happens there, because that would be really sort of interesting um, I- as well. So thank you both once again, and um, we'll catch up with you both soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Claire.